Okay, hello everybody. Let's get started. Uh, before we begin, this workshop is going to, to be a little bit different from what we've been doing so far. Um, I have two versions of the workshop, depending on how tired you are or how willing to get your hands dirty. So this is going to be everything about coding and coding in Python in particular. So if you are willing to follow with me, all the material is online. I will send you the link now. And there is a cloud environment where you can run all the same things that I'm going to run. And actually, um, because live demos never fail, I'm going to use exactly the same environment as you should use. And if for any reason there's only like a couple of people following or stuff like that, uh, I think it's going to be more interesting if at some point like we turn this into a discussion of what we can or we cannot do and we try to do some, even some live coding or stuff like that. Um, and then plan C is that I stand here for one hour talking to you, uh, but then after 20 minutes you will start thinking about the coffee that you need, and it's probably going to be a little bit boring. So I hope that uh, we can make it a little bit interactive, okay? And also I don't bite like all of the speakers that have been here, so please feel free to interrupt me at any time and ask any questions. So first of all, um, Thank you to Jorge and Elefteria that are also part of the Poliastro team that kindly came from Thessaloniki and uh, Madrid as well. Actually, the trip from Madrid was a little bit shorter than the one from Thessaloniki. And Jorge was kind enough to print this super cool t-shirt, so props to that. And this workshop is going to be about interplanetary mission analysis. So the outline that we have ahead of us is uh, I'm going to do a little bit of introduction. I have no clue how much do you know about orbital mechanics or mission analysis or everything, so I'm going to make it a little bit basic, although some of you will already know some of the concepts. A uh, very short introduction. Then I will do an overview of Polyastro and how does the API work and all the objects that you can use and everything. And uh, we will talk a little bit about performance and API design because there are two very important things in Polyastro and they are kind of related to each other and then we will see lots of applications of things that you can do with Polyastro. If you go to the website or the work of the workshop, oscw.space, then I'm sure you already did, and you go to the contributions list, you will see if you look for mission analysis, you can get to the description of the workshop and you have a link to the materials here at the bottom in case you want to follow, there are further instructions there. Also if you want to type it directly, it's on GitHub, of course with an MIT license because this is the open source, gives a workshop. And you can go to github.com slash polyastro slash tutorial. I don't see many laptops on, which means that we're going to, oh, perfect. Which means that we're going to, oh, there's a brave one following on the, ta on the tablet, okay. Uh, I don't have any guarantees on that. Um, and if you go to the, URL of the materials, you will see a blue button here called launch binder, which will create a Jupyter notebook environment with all the dependencies that you need and all the notebooks with the code that we're going to follow and the explanations and everything. So while this is loading, that can take a little bit of time, let me do the introduction first. So a couple of words about myself. Um, Again, my name is Juan Luis Cano. I'm an aerospace engineer from Madrid, from Spain, uh, with a passion for orbits, open source, satellites, programming. I'm also the chair of the Python España Association, which is kind of like the Spanish branch of the Python Software Foundation. And we organize the national Python conference in Spain that last week had around 800 attendees. Uh, I used to organize the Python Madrid meetup, so I am like kind of the Python guy uh, around here. Uh, with the permission of the LSF, of course, that use Python for a lot of things. Um, I'm working as a software developer, or 
how I like to call myself these days, mission uh, analysis uh, engineer in Satellogic, which is a company that creates a constellation of Earth observation satellites. And we use Python for everything as well, even to run some stuff in orbit. Uh, I will gladly accept questions about that uh, later on. And Agapo de Elada, which kind of means I love Greece with my really bad pronunciation of Greek. Thank you, thank you so much. And that's me on the first open source CubeSat workshop, by the way, which was in ESOC. So, what's mission analysis in the first place? Uh, according to this document that I retrieved from ESA, mission analysis is the analysis of satellite orbits to determine how best to achieve the objectives of a space mission. I like very much the presentation from Boris uh, this morning where he had like a broader concept of what mission analysis is, but for this, we're going to focus only on the orbital part, um, so nothing about the power requirements or link budget or anything like that. I don't have to explain why things orbit, but I still love to showcase this diagram of um, a thought experiment that Newton did in, the, in his times, um, which kind of displays why uh, all this stuff is going around uh, in orbit. So the problem from a mathematical point of view is very simple, like the uh, simplified version of it, but uh, the thing is that we have uh, very strong uh, requirements on the accuracy because we want to take pictures from the Earth with very good accuracy or we want to do communications in a very precise way or etc. cetera. Um, then there's also lots of perturbations and this affects uh, the certainty with which I can know the position and velocity of the satellite in a future moment in time. And of course, if you lose contact with the satellite, then it's a needle in a haystack. Um, there is another workshop that is called the Interplanetary CubeSat Workshop. Uh, all the presentations are online. I highly recommend you to check them out. And here there is like an overview of some CubeSats that ESA is developing for a variety of missions. And in particular, I find it super interesting that there are some of these that are already um, considered to be in interplanetary missions. For example, we have the Argo CubeSat, which is a 12-unit uh, satellite that is going to demonstrate asteroid rendezvous, which is uh, uh, quite an interesting fit. Then we also have the Hera CubeSats, two six-unit CubeSats that are going to do uh, asteroid observations and try to deflect some asteroids. So this is uh, not anymore uh, applications that stay in low Earth orbit, but we already have uh, some interesting stuff going outside of uh, the gravitational well of the Earth. And of course, um, uh, this is going to be much more developed in the future. Everything we're going to explain today also works for low Earth orbit, of course, but in polyester we have some unique capabilities for interplanetary analysis. So before we begin, some alternative tools for mission analysis that probably most of you already have heard of. So the best one is AGI SDK, which is the commercial one. Um, SDK is the software that all the big companies are using probably. Uh, it's a graphical interface with some scripting capabilities. It's probably the most powerful tool in the market, but it's also the most expensive one. It's closed source, so we don't like it. And it also runs on Windows, so it requires you to have like a virtual machine if you're a Linux user like me. Then there's also Orekit that we already had a presentation about it this morning. It's a Java library, so it's supposed to be used uh, from, the, from a programming environment. And it's very mature, very widely used. Um, but from what I could see, it's not so focused on interplanetary applications. So it mostly concerns about low Earth uh, orbit, uh, high orbit, GPS, um, geostationary orbit and stuff like that. Then there's also SPICE, which is a toolkit by NASA. And this one is also quite old and they still develop it to this day. And this, it has bindings in C, Fortran, IDL, MATLAB, Python, so basically everything, every programming language that is being used in the space industry out there. It's very battle tested and they use it for uh, lots of missions uh, in many different segments. 
but it requires a little bit of expertise. It's not exactly straightforward to get it right at the beginning. And also you have to generate what they call kernels, which are files with the data uh, that contains all the description of the mission, which is also uh, not so easy. And then lastly you have GMAT. We already mentioned it uh, compared to docs. And it's again a graphical user interface. It has some scripting capabilities in a language that resembles MATLAB somehow. And from my point of view is the closest open source competitor to SDK nowadays. Uh, but also from my experience sometimes it's a little bit unstable, at least uh, the versions that I've used on Linux, maybe on Windows is a, a bit different. Uh, but anyway, it's a great piece of software and it works perfectly. And we are validating all the polyastro algorithms against all these tools. And then of course we have polyastro, which is a pure Python library, uh, which is good because Elon Musk apparently, apparently loves Python. Let me, uh, exp ah, I cannot increase the zoom. Anyway, um, yeah, I don't remember what was the conversation here, but uh, I don't need anything else. It's optimized for ease of use and ease of contribution, uh, especially because uh, we will see now that uh, the code uh, is meant to be easy to read, easy to, uh, to expand, to modify. So we're not trying to make like the most professional thing on the market that can get you to the moon with one meter accuracy. But we're trying to make something that is uh, appropriate for uh, preliminary orbit analysis, people that are learning, uh, when you want to do some quick calculation, uh, interactive visualization, and so forth. And also for people that come more from a software background that they pick up software libraries more easily. So with all these introduction, let's begin. I don't know if this is already, hmm. okay, there's one last step. Maybe a couple of minutes more. How many of you have experience with Python? Okay, how many of you, oh, most of you, okay. Uh, how many of you use it on a weekly basis? Daily basis? While you're sleeping? <laughs> <laughs> ah, there are some people, okay. Okay, so I don't think you need a super strong knowledge of Python to follow this tutorial. Um, if it loads at some point. Still loading. It's weird because the Wi-Fi is working perfectly, so it's clearly the Python problem. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> ah, here it is. Okay. Okay, well this finishes loading. Okay, so a little bit of overview of Polyastro. It's a Python library for astrodynamics and orbital mechanics, and it's focused on interactive and friendly use with an eye on performance. We will talk a little bit about that later. So again, it's a pure Python, so it's very easy to install if you already have a working Python environment. Uh, it's licensed under the MIT license, so it's uh, commercial friendly as well. And it has, it leverages a lot parts of the ecosystem of uh, scientific uh, Python already, so it's very easy to integrate with physical units, astronomical time scales, and so forth, as we will see in the examples. And you can check the documentation here. We spent a lot of time uh, writing it, so I hope you appreciate it. 
And we also accept donations on Open Collective. I was not supposed to announce this uh, yet because I wanted to finish the perks, but we already have a donor since last night. This was kind of unexpected. So now that we have one, I welcome you to uh, also consider donating if you use it and consider it useful. And the latest version, 0.13, was released uh, some weeks ago. So we have some fresh fritters uh, from the oven. This is still loading, my friends. Let me check just in case. Hmm. So a little bit of history. I started the project in 2013 and it was a mix of Fortran and MATLAB running Octave and Python code that was supposed to work in my computer and nowhere else. And then during the years I did uh, several refactors and I replaced some Fortran algorithms with Python which uh, contrary to popular belief didn't have such a high impact on performance. It was moderate. And since 2017 I've been participating very successfully in Google Summer of Code. So every year I have at least uh, one student working on it and this year I had two, Jorge and Eleftheria. And the program it's uh, now uh, picking up a little bit. So, aha, here it is. Okay. This is, can be gone. I'm using the same thing for the slides and the code itself. So, okay. Sorry? Ah, oh, great. Great, great. Okay, so. Can you see the screen? Okay. Okay, so first we're going to make some basic imports. Uh, the most important part here is that we're using this library called AstroPy. Uh, AstroPy is uh, kind of on another level, it's a collection of tools uh, useful for astronomy. So they have things like time scales and reference frames and stuff like that. We use that internally a lot. And then for the moment, we only need two objects from Polyastro. We need the planet Earth, and then we need a orbit object that we're going to use for everything. So the way you define orbits in Polyastro is like this. So notice that we're creating the position vector that we call R there, and so we use um, these values here, and this is how we apply physical units to it. This is coming from AstroPy here, and the good thing is that all the uh, safe APIs of Polyastro accept physical units, and they accommodate all the quantities for you. So if you are mixing the radius of the planet in kilometers and then you have a position in meters, then you cannot uh, go wrong because all the system is uh, converting the units for you, and this is super useful. Um, and then we create the velocity vector as well, in this case in kilometers per second. And then we create this orbit object from these vectors where we specify what's the attractor, in this case the Earth, position, velocity, and the time that it's uh, right now. So the first thing that Polyastro does is creating this summary of the orbit. So here I have that this is a an orbit with a perigee of 7,000 kilometers, an apogee of 10,000 kilometers, an inclination of 153 degrees that is expressed in geocentric celestial reference system, which means there is an inertial values around the Earth with an epoch of 2019, October 14th, uh, blah, 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 in UTC. Yes. Can someone give this man a microphone, please? <laughs> Sorry, because I didn't hear the question properly. Oh, you have mine. So you said uh, you defined the attractor? Is that done immediately also the origin of your coordinate frame? 
Yes, internally, Polyastro has some defaults to choose a coordinate frame for you. So what it's doing, it's mapping all of the attractors that are defined. I we have like the planets of the solar system. And then when you create an orbit that is centered on the Earth, then it has an inertial system whose center is the Earth. So if you create an orbit around Mars, for example, we can do it right now. We import Mars as well. And then we can change this for Mars. And then this is a Mars ICRS, which is a celestial inertial system, but with the center in Mars. So let me bring this back to how it was before. Uh, there was another question. Yes. The microphone has disappeared. Okay. Okay. So from polyastro two body you import orbit. Yes. Um, what other options I have for two body? For two body, well, the object that we use uh, is mostly the orbit, and there are, there's a bunch of other stuff. So you can explore that with the autocomplete, polyastro to body. Import. And then we have some other modules, for example, we have several propagators um, by default. Um, uh, how it's called, one analytical propagator is chosen, but you have many of them, and actually Jorge implemented like 10 propagators uh, this summer. And we have a thrust module as well, because we have some guidance laws for low thrust, which is uh, kind, kind of unique. Uh, haven't seen other software packages with this. Uh, we have some angle conversion uh, functions, for example, to convert the mean anomaly to true anomaly, or the eccentric to true, and stuff like that. And yeah, it's mostly, that if you want to check the full documentation, you have this high level API, and then you have all the modules that are available in the library. We will talk a little bit about all of them mostly. Any other question? Thank you very much. Keep the questions coming. Okay, and now uh, plotting the orbit is as simple as dot plot. We can use a label and then this generates a plot with map.lib using the perifocal frame. So the x axis goes towards the eccentricity vector to the perigee and uh, the orbit is contained in the, in the plane that we're plotting. We also have the option, this is a static plot that we can save to, to some paper or something, but we also have the option to use um, interactive plotting and this allows us to uh, plot in 3D as well. Uh, plotting in 3D in, in Python used to be kind of a nightmare some years ago, not so many years ago. Uh, but now we have a library that is called Plotly, where we can actually like rotate and pan and zoom and everything we want. Uh, yeah, our object is right there. Um, and we have some controls for the figure that depend on, on Plotly. You can export it to a static plot and you can do lots of, uh, lots of things. So the idea here is all the time that simple operations should be simple. That's the philosophy. So I had a little exercise here. Uh, there's a couple of people following, uh, but I will do it uh, at the same time. So for example, if we want to create an object, an orbit, instead of using uh, position and velocity, we want to use uh, classical orbital elements, for example, the classical Keplerian elements. Uh, we also have a function for that. In this case, uh, we have semi-major axis, eccentricity, inclination, right ascension of the ascending node, uh, argument of perigee, and true anomaly. So the way to do this, um, again, we have this orbit. In this case, instead of using from vectors, we have from classical. We have to specify uh, the attractor again. I didn't say that in the exercise, but let's choose the Earth. And then we have a semi-major axis of 1.52 
we have to specify the units, so we can say u dot au, this is astronomical units, and then we have an electricity of 0 0.09. Here the absence of units is specified with u dot one, and so forth. u dot one, and then we have to specify the rest, so we have 1.95 degrees of inclination, then 49 degrees of right ascension, 286 degrees of argument of periapsis, and 23 degrees of true anomaly. If we don't specify anything, uh, the epoch of the orbit is going to be set to J2000, so the year 2000, uh, 1st of January, midday. But we can specify our own epoch, so for example, if we say time of, sorry, Greek keyboard, it is. 2019, 10, 15, for example, midday, we can also change that. And then I have this summary representation. You can save this to an object. And then if I want to plot it, I only have to do orb.plot. And then again, um, I have this orbit here. Or I can do interactive equals true. And then instead of a static plot, again, I have something that I can zoom and I can pan and so forth. And okay. Okay? What time is it? Oh wow. Okay. So apart from directly specifying the elements, we can also create the uh, orbits from many different sources. So I have some examples here. For example, um uh, using the JPL planetary ephemeris. So with AstroPy, we can actually say, okay, now when you want to retrieve the positions of the planet, use the ephemerides of uh, JPL. So if we say, give me the osculating orbit of the Earth in some specific um, epoch, then it's uh, one line away. We also have an interface for the small bodies database, the SBDB. So, for example, if you want to retrieve the orbit of the asteroid Florence that had a close approach with the Earth in September 2017, if you remember, then you can use this from SBDB. And then there's a method called propagate that does exactly that. It advances uh, or goes backwards in time. So I can actually move this to more or less the date of the close approach. I can also retrieve the orbit of the Halley's comet. And then to plot everything together, I have some utility functions. For example, to plot the whole solar system, but only the inner planets. Um, and then to the same uh, figure, I'm going to add the Halley's Comet and the Florence uh, asteroid. So I have something like this in a few lines of code. And again, I can uh, interact with this figure and do whatever I want. There's even a way to see the whole uh, orbit of the Halley's Comet. I can go back like this. And that's it. Um, if we want, for example, to create an orbit from a TLE uh, using Celestrack, for example, there's currently no function in Polyestro for that. So we're going to use a, another open source library that's called Orbit Predictor that we open sourced in Satellogic a couple of years ago. So there's a way to get a source using uh, the Celeste track uh, TLEs, and then we get a predictor for the ISS, for example, and then we retrieve the position in some specific moment in time. And with this, I have already the position, velocity, and the time, so with that, I can already create a polyastro orbit. Uh, for the other thing about polyastro is that it tries to not get in the way and make you use all the ecosystem of Python. So for example, if you have some custom thing that is not supported, it should be easy to do too. So in this case, we're using AstroPy coordinates uh, to create an, uh, some coordinates in 
uh, rotating coordinates because as you can see here, this is the position in ECEF and the velocity in ECEF. So now we need to convert that to inertial coordinates. So we're going to do that with this piece of code here. We specify the, the velocity and now the position. Then we create this ITRS, which is kind of uh, earth fixed uh, coordinates. And finally, we have a function that is called from coordinates that accepts uh, AstroPy coordinates. And then I have an orbit uh, using that data. I can actually check that this resembles the orbit of the ISS. So everything makes sense. Um, yeah, okay, there's another exercise here, but we can uh, skip that. A couple of words about the performance and API design. Um, you might or might not remember uh, the Mars Climate Orbiter that did uh, what we call in technical terms a uh, lethal braking, which means uh, suddenly decelerating uh, very fast towards the surface of, the, of Mars. And apparently the mistake was that one contractor was using the metric system and the other one was using an uh, imperial system. This is a very classical uh, example of a uh, units uh, mishap. So the first idea is that you should never uh, commit these kind of mistakes. This is why all the APAs accept units. And also, there's another thing um, that is a bit uh, up to uh, heated debate in some circles, which is that we try to make the code as simple as possible. This is an example of myself in 2013 because I found a way to like rotate a million uh, coordinate frames in one line of code in parallel. I don't know, it was a marvelous line of code. But then I went over it six months later and I did not understand how it worked. So what I did was turning this magical line of code into uh, 30 lines of code uh, that now I can understand because I'm only human. So the idea is to keep the code as human and, and as understandable as possible because the um, overlap of people that know astrodynamics and Python and worry about open source and happen to know the project is already small. So I try to make as easy as possible for anybody to contribute. So we kind of uh, don't use any magic as far as we can use. Um, but performance comes at a price because yes, as you already know, Python is slow, but we have a magic sauce for that because there's a project that compiles uh, Python code um, uh, just in time. So this is what we're using everywhere in Polyastro to actually make the algorithms fast. And I really recommend you to check it out. We have a lot of contact with the developers. And the interesting thing is that we have things like the propagators and the two body solvers and etc. Everything is coded in Python, but with this library that you just add one line and then everything magically is fast. Um, uh, makes the code actually uh, good to use. The disadvantage is that you have to keep the, um, some high level features of Python out of this because this doesn't support everything. So this is why we came up with this kind of architecture in Polyastro. We have some nice high level API that we've been using so far, uh, all these orbit and from vectors, from classical, etc. And then below we have the dangerous algorithms that are implemented in uh, Python with Numba, so they don't accept units, therefore you can mess it up, but they are nevertheless available for you uh, to use. So if you check the documentation, the, it's divided in two. You have here the high-level API, and then you also have the core-level API with some, basically a mirror of what we have in the other side, um, but closer to the machine, so to speak. And this is an example of how it works. For example, to convert the eccentric anomaly to the true anomaly, we have one function that does it fast. So we essentially wrap it and say, okay, so this is going to accept radians or degrees or any angle, and this is going to accept a dimensionless quantity. And then we do all the magic ourselves. We pass the raw values to the magic function, and then we retrieve the result and apply a unit back. So basically you're using this everywhere. Uh, any questions so far? Comments? Yes? Uh, 
sorry, if we can use this to orbit around Mars and, or what did you ask? Ah, yes, in fact, uh, there was a guy in the Easy Trucker some years ago uh, simulating TRAPPIST-1, this uh, mighty planetary system that is uh, several light years away. Um, so yeah, when you want to create a, a custom body, there's a, like if you already know object-oriented programming, there's a way to inherit from the base body class, and then you define all the orbits around that. And actually the difficult thing is to define the, the coordinate systems. So you have to say, how does this custom body that you're creating relate to, for example, the solar system or the sun or something like that? Okay. Okay, so let's see some examples of other things that we can do. Uh, there's one, there's a set of notebooks that you have in the repository where we explore like a variety of topics. So for example, this is a very good one because it's very short. There's a way to visualize the Tesla Roadster that SpaceX sent to uh, the solar system uh, some months ago. So the only thing here is that there's a function called from horizons that uses the NASA horizon system uh, that holds ephemerides for several objects. So if you run this thing, uh, you can say, okay, give me the position and velocity of the SpaceX Roadster in this particular epoch, so February 18th, 2018. And then if you want to plot it and visualize it in the solar system, uh, you can use the same function that we were using before, and this is the trajectory of, uh, of the car, basically. So again, it's supposed to be as short as possible. And here we have an interactive uh, plot in three dimensions. Okay, here it is. And it's actually crossing the, um, the Mars orbit. So that's one thing. Then some other thing that uh, Jorge added uh, this summer, uh, that I love to show it because it's uh, so beautiful. Uh, pork chop plots, thanks. Port shock plots are a tool to visualize uh, launch opportunities and opportunity windows for interplanetary missions. So on one axis you visualize the arrival velocity and the, on the other axis you visualize, no sorry, I'm saying nonsense. On one, on the vertical axis you visualize the arrival date and the horizontal axis the departure date and then you have some regions where it's optimal to make the launch. So we have a module for that and for example, if we want to simulate uh, launch opportunities from the Earth to Mars, we can generate some time ranges. For example, in 2005, uh, this is because uh, we were trying to replicate an old paper that we found from NASA. And then uh, with this function here, we are essentially saying, okay, give me opportunities from Earth to Mars in this launch span and this arrival span. And then it's solving the boundary value problem uh, in a grid of values, essentially. So it's not a complicated thing to do. And you end up with this beautiful pork chop plot here, uh, where you can actually see that there's an optimal region here if you launch in August 2005 and arriving on March 2006. And there's another optimal region here uh, a little bit further than that. And you can actually see that there's some periodical pattern more or less uh, repeating here. And also some other interesting stuff, which is that for some particular combinations of launch and arrival date, there's uh, the cost of delta V that you need, it's literally uh, impossible for you to launch. So this is the comparison with the old figure of the paper. So I think we made a good job, at least with the colors. And so I'm super proud of it. Okay, so that's one thing, and some other thing. Um, instead of providing like a super advanced propagator that does everything for you, like HPOP from SDK or SGP4, which is already implemented in several open source libraries, uh, what we offer is a way to analyze separately 
all the different perturbations that you can have. So we have several examples here, for example, to analyze um, the atmospheric drag, third body effects, and in this case, the sun or the moon or whatever you want. J2 perturbation, important for sun synchronous missions and other stuff. So, for example, in this particular case, we can say, okay, we have a circular orbit, and now I want to simulate how does the um, altitude of the orbit evolve uh, when I apply some atmospheric drag with some coefficient of drag and some shape factor and so forth. So you have this kind of figure here. We observe the decay that uh, uh, we expected to see. We can also apply the J2 uh, perturbation. So essentially we're calling a propagate function that gives us like lower level control or what, of what we want to do. And then you can see that this is uh, quite fast. And then again, uh, we're observing the evolution of the right ascension that we expected uh, when we have, when we are orbiting planets that are not perfectly spherical. And we have another example with the, uh, with an orbit, with an influence uh, on the moon. So that's for natural perturbations. Okay, this is actually the most beautiful one. Okay, so you can see how the inclination is uh, being affected here. And then apart from natural perturbations, we can... Yes. Um, what do you mean that there are no textbook uh, formulas? Yes, yes, of course. So, for example, well, the formulas are going to be different depending on the model that you apply. In, the, in our particular case, uh, we use the Cowell's method. Uh, and then within this uh, framework, we define all the perturbations in terms of acceleration. So, for example, if you go and see what's the J2 perturbation source code, uh, well, we have this uh, formula here. This is a bit difficult to see, but if we go to the actual documentation of this, perturbations, J2, yeah, this is the formula that we are using. This, this is taken from a textbook, so. Uh, where am I? Okay. Yes, so apart from natural perturbations, you also have a way to apply uh, thrust. So you can define your own uh, guidance law. For example, let's apply a constant thrust in some particular direction or a thrust law that evolves with time in some particular way. So for example, in this case, uh, we're applying a and in polyester, we define several guidance laws uh, that are optimal, that are known to be optimal. So for example, there is a way to change both the inclination and the eccentricity simultaneously using low thrust uh, that minimizes the fuel consumption. So we have implemented that one and you end up with an orbit uh, kind of like this. So you are at the same time changing the inclination as you can see here and also the eccentricity. And there is a very interesting example as well of changing both the size of the orbit and the inclination of the orbit because it's actually op more optimal to change the inclination when you have a larger orbit. So the system already knows that it has to enlarge the orbit, then apply the inclination change, and then shrink the orbit back. So it's quite interesting to see. And of course, we can apply several perturbations, and that's it. So as a, I don't know, uh, okay. One more thing. Yes, two more things. Three more things. So we also defined some way to study maneuvers uh, apart from the thrust that we already saw, we can also apply impulsive maneuvers at any point in the orbit. So we can simulate uh, changes 
um, in the orbit and etc. For so, for example, this is a reproduction of the Juno mission from NASA. Oof, from NASA. Typo. So, well, this is very similar to what we were seeing before, and. Then, uh, with an API like this, you define uh, what is the impulsive maneuver that you are going to do, and applying the plotting function that we already know, that we already know, we can plot the, uh, several segments of the orbit and end up with something like this, where you see all the flybys that the Juno mission uh, was doing. All of this is uh, using data that is available on the internet, so I have uh, no uh, secrets at NASA. Uh, so all of this can be reproduced at home. And then this is a kind of a recent addition. We were trying to simulate the orbit of the Parker Solar Probe. And for this, we actually needed to do some targeting. Um, there are some formulas here for things that uh, could be higher level. But what we're trying to do is um, to solve the boundary value problem in this case using what they call the Lambert problem or the Lambert algorithm. Uh, but we want to check because there are several solutions to this arc over here. So there's a way to check which one of the arcs uh, we want to use uh, depending on the energy requirements and so forth. So you already have that. And then as a last thing, As a last thing, I have it in the user guide. Oh, yes. So there's a system created by the same company that makes STK that is called Cesium. If you don't know it, I highly recommend you to check it out. Cesiumgs.org. And contrary to STK, this is actually an open source system, so everybody can use it. And it's like an advanced visualization library. At the beginning, it was for orbits, but now you can do all sorts of uh, 3D stuff uh, that involves geospatial data. So Cesium works with, um, uh, with JavaScript, of course, but you can also export the orbit in a declarative way using a subset of JSON that they call uh, say set ML. Um, so for example, if we want to I'm going to copy this code in a new notebook. So if we want to visualize an polyastro object in cesium, then uh, Elefteria added this work uh, during the summer. There is an object called the CZML extractor. So I can specify here where sample points. I can specify when do I want to sample the orbit, in which uh, period, and then I have this extractor here that is going to turn extractor packets, and then this is exported to this specific format that Cesium works with, and then when you have all this um, format here, you can actually manage to You can actually manage to get a visualization that it's much more advanced and you can use cesium to visualize all these uh, objects and you can also add uh, 3D objects on the ground, ground stations and etc. So it's actually quite nice and we're in the process of expanding a little bit more all these capabilities. Okay, so that's it for the mission analysis uh, workshop. I'm going to stop here. Um, if you're interested in uh, doing some preliminary analysis for some mission because you don't know if you want to do some orbit racing or orbit uh, station keeping or something like that, or you, are, or you have formation flying, for example, or you're launching several CubeSats at the same time and you need to do some phasing, these are the kinds of use cases that we're interested in. So you can talk to any of us with the polyester t-shirts 
And also online, we have a um, we have a chat room in Riot uh, Matrix. That is also the same thing that Labor Space Foundation uses. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention, and see you next. Great. No last questions for, for Juan? That's fine. Yeah. You have to go, yeah. So all these plots that are being generated are static in a way. You have the dynamic that you can, but it's all, all the data that's being displayed is pre-generated. Is there uh, a, a way or are you thinking about to, to put an animation at least that you can drag in time and see the thing moving? Yes. Yeah, I actually, I've been thinking for a while about animations in particular. Uh, I'm, you know, the problem is never like the actual implementation. The problem is arriving to an API that is kind of nice and it's not getting in the way. So, but yeah, it's within, it's within reach. We've been struggling a lot with uh, this uh, 3D system that it's called Plotly because they've been like refactoring it once every six months. Uh, for the past couple of years, but now it kind of settled and it's properly integrated in the rest of the Jupyter and Python ecosystem. So now I think we can devote more time to that sort of thing. We had another question over here. Uh, what is your personal favorite mission to simulate? Simu sim simulate? My personal favorite mission, I've been looking forward for a lot of time to simulate uh, Rosetta because it has a lot of flybys and that's uh, super fun to, to see. And also Bepi Colombo, it, again, it's uh, doing a lot of flybys to get uh, near Mercury. Um, it's not, I mean, it's totally possible to do it. It's just like a lot of code because you have to simulate them all. But yeah, I'm open to collaboration in that respect. Nice. Okay, well, thank you, Juan, once thank you. more. <laughs>